The Sustainability Now Telesummit is honored to share audacious ideas and innovative solutions from more than 30 experts from around the globe. Learn how we can work together to shape a world that works. Here's your host, Mira Rubin. Welcome back to the Sustainability Now Telesummit, shaping a world that works. And now you get the pleasure of meeting William Padilla Brown. William is a social entrepreneur, urban shaman, citizen scientist and mycologist, which means that one of his specialties is mushroom cultivation. He's a certified permaculture uh, designer and he founded and operates Mycosymbiotics LLC, which is a small mycological research and mushroom production business. And Williams educated children and adults around the country in topics including mushrooms, spirulina, insects, information technology, and permaculture. And he experiments with a variety of models for food, medicine, and energy production. William, welcome. We're really, really glad to have you here with us today. Uh, thanks for having me. So, go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> well, we we are so happy to have you here today. Um, we had the pleasure, uh, Scott, my business partner in sustainability now and I, of coming to visit you at your facility. And um, we're going to be sharing footage from your laboratory and sort of a tutorial. And before we even get started, what we're going to be talking about today is mushrooms. Yeah. And... I have to ask you, why mushrooms? Um, why not mushrooms? I mean, uh, the biggest thing for me, the biggest factor was as I was transitioning into learning more about permaculture and sustainability, um, I was taking a lot of classes on urban agriculture um, and uh, permaculture and things of that nature, even rewilding classes. And people could tell me all about plants. They could tell me all about gardening. Um, but there'll be mushrooms popping up in the garden. There'll be mushrooms while, while we're doing wild foraging for plants. And nobody could really tell me about mushrooms in my area. So um, I figured that was a niche that needed to be filled. I figured I wasn't the only person in my area that might want to know about mushrooms. So um, back in 2014, I really started working on it. Um, I mean, I started growing mushrooms when I was 18 years old, but um, it never really like dawned on me to like bring it to the next level of like commercial production and education until around 2014. Um, then I started really going after it. Very cool. Now you specialize in a particular kind of mushroom. You grow bunches of mushrooms, but one particular mushroom that you specialize in is cordyceps. And why is that? Well, um, in 2015, when I really started up my business, um, I, uh, I started a mushroom festival, a mushroom and arts festival in Pennsylvania. And the first year, um, somebody found a cordyceps militaris, my friend Charlie, he runs Mush Love Mushrooms in Richmond, Virginia. Um, he found a cordyceps militaris specimen on the last day of the festival, literally in the last couple of hours. And I asked him if I could have it to clone it. I wanted to take it home and then learn as much as I could about it. I knew a little bit about its nutritional benefits and medicinal benefits. Um, so I took it home and, uh, um, I cloned it and I started looking all over the internet to figure out how to grow it. And there was no English literature on cultivating cordyceps at all. Um, so again, I saw a niche that needed to be filled and um, I did as much research as I could watching a lot of videos from um, Asian cordyceps cultivation uh, operations and uh, kind of just watched what they did and then mimicked it to figure out how to do it on my own. And then I wrote a cultivation guide um, and that kind of propelled me forward. So. I was operating the first commercial scale cordyceps fruiting body production in the US. Um, and then I wrote the first like English cultivation guide on cultivating cordyceps. Um, so that's been kind of my journey with cordyceps and um, just becoming a big educator for, uh, for the mushrooms in the US has been um, really prolific for my career. And that's, that's most of the reason why I grow cordyceps besides that they're really cool. They are really cool and people are going to have a chance to see what they look like. Uh, one of the things that you said is fruiting body. And I don't, I think people that aren't familiar with mycology might not know what that means. So maybe you can clarify. Um, so a fruiting body, uh, if you think about a fruit on a plant, the mushroom is the fruiting body of a fungus. So um, if you see an apple growing on an apple tree, the mushroom is the apple for the, for the fungus, for the mycelium. So the mycelium is like the plant type part that usually lives underground or inside of logs or in plants and things like that. And the mushroom is the, the fruit. 
And you also mentioned medicinal properties. I think, I think mushrooms are very misunderstood and mm -hmm. you're helping to uh, dissolve a lot of the preconceptions that people might have had around mushrooms. So just maybe you can talk a little bit about medicinal properties and, and sort of busting the myths around mushroom fears. Um, yeah, so I mean, a lot of people have like a mycophobia in our country just due to the fact that a lot of people have like a big disconnect from their like home countries and their old family traditions of uh, foraging and eating mushrooms. Um, and a lot of people have just like bad experiences of eating like nasty button mushrooms out of a can or something like that when they're little. Um, so a lot of people think that mushrooms, and then a lot of people think that they're going to like die because mushrooms are poisonous and things like that. Um, I mean, toxic and poisonous plants are more dangerous than mushrooms. Um, like as far as like mushroom goes, which I don't recommend this, but it's possible like when identifying wild mushrooms, you can taste the mushroom and spit it out. And if, even if it is toxic, it won't hurt you. Whereas like a poisonous plant, if it just touches your skin can give you like bumps and things like that. There's no mushrooms that you can't just like pick up and look at, even if they're toxic, it's only toxic if you ingest it. And, um, there's only a small fraction of all the mushrooms in the world that are actually toxic. More people get sick from, uh, mushrooms being improperly handled at the grocery store and at restaurants than actually eating a, a poisonous mushroom. Um, so more so mushrooms are incredibly medicinal. Almost all mushrooms have um, these beneficial polysaccharide, long chain sugars or starch um, that is uh, super uh, immunomodulatory. So it's beneficial for people that have like overactive immune systems or underactive immune systems as it can help balance, balance them out. Um, and then aside from the polysaccharides, which almost all mushrooms have, there's also the species specific unique compounds, um, like different mushrooms have different compounds that are specific to that mushroom that usually have some sort of medicinal property or medicinal benefit. So there's all sorts of things to explore and I'll cover some of that during my presentation. Okay, well, that's a great segue. Let's, let's jump into your presentation then. Awesome. All right, guys. So this is my fungi and farming presentation for sustainability now. Um, where we're going to cover a lot of topics as far as cultivating mushrooms. So uh, we're going to go ahead and get started here. Um, so here we're looking at my lab. A lot of people um, get into this mindset that you need to have um, a really expensive laboratory to grow mushrooms. Everything has to be completely sterile. Um, coming from my background, uh, dropping out of high school and having a child at a young age, I had to uh, really utilize my resources to the fullest potential and like uh, figure out how to do this without spending too much money. So I figured out how to set up laboratories and do most of this from a home style setting, which I found to be very beneficial for the people that I educate. Um, just for the simple fact that it looks replicable. They're in a familiar setting. It's more comfortable and they, they uh, realize that they actually have the potential to do this in their own homes. So, um, and then as you can see, uh, we use child labor in the laboratories, uh, <laughs> tiny little hands where they can get to the mushrooms really easily. Um, <laughs> But I really just have no, I have no uh, age limit on my classes. So um, as long as nobody's going to be interrupting the class, I'll teach all sorts of ages. You can set up a lab really easily in your home with minimal effort. And we'll talk a little bit more about that moving forward. Um, but it's just really good to see that it is very replicable. So here we have one of my older mushroom farms. And again, just coming from the economic standpoint, um, you can see a lot of these mushrooms are hanging from rope ladders uh, from the ceiling. Um, where most mushroom farmers use the shelves that I have in the back, but those shelving units can be anywhere from uh, 40 to $100 per unit. So it was way cheaper to just buy a bunch of these, um, of these ropes and then have my friend who's good at tying knots, uh, tie them into rope ladders that we tied together at the top and then we could hang our mushroom bags on there and they worked out really, really well. Um, and this was not even at the max capacity. There was uh, my, my, Next mushroom farm, which if you want to follow the journey, all my videos on uh, apex growers, like chronological order of like me starting from nothing to growing all these other mushroom farms. Um, so you can definitely check that out. But um, we filled up the room, we filled up the space with all these hanging mushrooms. What um, kind of mushrooms are we looking at? Um, so we're looking at oyster mushrooms right now. And I like to point out that my friend is wearing a jacket um, because it was cold outside and that I'm only growing these two types of oyster mushrooms, which are the white and the blue oyster mushrooms, which uh, grow very well in cold weather. So if you're um, trying to keep it sustainable and not spend too much money on, on utilities, 
um, you can switch the mushrooms that you're growing um, based on the climate, based on what kind of weather is outside so that you're not uh, overexpending on utilities. So I'll grow warm weather mushrooms in the summer, I'll grow cold weather mushrooms in the winter time. In the back of the room, uh, you can see this like kind of cut out with this spray foam insulation around it. There's a fan right there that's uh, pulling air out of the room. Um, the room was completely sealed except for one entrance point which had an air filter on it. So it was creating a negative pressure and the only place where the air could come in was through the filter. Um, all of the air was being sucked out. That was full of spores, it was full of CO2. Um, and then I had a couple humidifiers around in this, uh, in this room to keep the mushrooms um, in a proper environment. Usually the humidity is around 70 to 90%. And then I would go in there and mist uh, the mushrooms with the spray bottle, to keep them in their perfect condition there. You can see here a little bit more close up. We have these mushrooms growing out of the side of the bag, but we also have mushrooms growing out of the top of the bag in the back. Mushrooms that grow out of the top of the bag um, typically um, will have a smaller point from where they, they grew out of, and there's more of like a floral looking uh, mushroom that the restaurants seem to like a little bit more. Um, and then uh, these ones in the back, we can always just split them in half, put them in pint jars and, or pint containers and sell those at farmer's markets. Um, so here eventually I was upgrading. I finally uh, had enough funds to buy these rack systems. I filled them up with these mushroom blocks. Um, you can see tiny little bumps starting to form on the sides of these mushroom blocks. And this was about three to four days before this picture. Um, so you can see that the mushrooms grow very, very fast. Um, and one thing I'd like to note about this picture is um, there's a lot of like wrinkling in the top of the caps. Um, this is just due to the fact that I wasn't able to harvest them fast enough. So um, you want to harvest them before the cap opens up all the way um, because once the cap is fully open, then they're not going to have as long as a, of a shelf life and you're typically going to want to dry those out. Um, again, if you go to my YouTube channel, Apex Grower, you can go check out these videos of this harvest. Um, it's, uh, one video says 250 pound, the other video says 350 pound mushroom harvest. And this was utilizing about half of the space in a 16 uh, or 18 by 20 uh, room. Um, so it's not that big of a room and you can get very, very large harvests by maintaining a proper environmental conditions. So low CO2, high humidity, um, and you can be pumping out loads and loads of mushrooms like this. And William, how much do these mushrooms sell for a pound about? Um, in my area, oysters go um, from wholesale around $7 a pound up to retail, which you can get about $12 a pound for them. Um, so that those 100 pound harvests end up being pretty significant. And how long from start to finish? Well, from the point of inoculation, whenever you introduce your uh, culture to whatever substrate you're going to grow it off of, whether it's coffee, whether it's sawdust, straw, whatever, um, it's going to take about uh, 10 to 15 days for full, for full colonization of the substrate. And then it's going to take about five to seven days before you, far, uh, before you start seeing your first um, pins starting to grow out of there. And then for, when you see the pins, it's gonna be about three or four days and then you have full grown mushrooms you can harvest. And then that's just the first flush. So you can harvest these mushrooms, wait about a week, and then they'll start producing again. You can harvest them again, wait about a week, and they'll produce again. And then at that point, they're gonna slow down. So if you wanna keep up commercial rotation, you're gonna take those, put those outside, let them get rained on and let them just fruit passively outdoors or um, inoculate them into like integrated garden systems or just let them turn to a passive garden and then eventually they'll be composted. Um, but we'll talk about other composting methods moving forward. Okay, great. Um, so some of the other mushrooms that I grow, this is uh, Heresia marinaceus, this is lion's mane. This mushroom is becoming very popular and getting a high market value due to the fact that it is uh, beneficial for the neurological system. So um, this mushroom has uh, two of those species specific unique compounds that I was mentioning earlier. Um, called Aranaceans and Heresianone. So if you look at the Latin name, Heresium Aranaceus, um, Heresianone for Heresium and then Aranaceans for Aranaceus. Um, and these uh, compounds have been shown to be very, very beneficial for the neurological system for people with uh, neurological degenerative diseases. And then also for people with healthy brains, it can increase uh, cognitive function, something like a nootropic. So these get a high uh, market value. Um, I was selling these around uh, $15, $16 a pound where I live. So for people that are looking at that image, um, you have the, the white area in the bags. Ex explain that that's the mycelium and how that, how that evolves, would you? Um, yeah, so 
Um, inside of the bags is uh, the fungus or the mycelium growing through the substrate, which I was growing them on a mixture of sawdust and coffee grounds, about 80% sawdust, 20% coffee grounds, um, and then adding the water. Um, and you add water to field capacity, so it's full, but it's not dripping, and water will come out if you squeeze it. Um, then it goes to a pasteurization method, which I'll go over. Um, and then I inoculate it with colonized grains. So I typically use grains because they break up really easily and then all of the grains serves as like a seed or an inoculation point of the um, uh, mycelium. So that's just the fungal body or the plant and then the fruiting body is the mushroom, just like I was saying earlier. So we keep the fungal body inside the bag and then the mushrooms grow out of the bag um, as if the plastic were like a bark on a tree, it grows through it like that um, when you poke some holes for it. Um, Great, thank you. So yeah, I'm really a big proponent of introducing your child, uh, children to mushrooms at a young age. Uh, a lot of people like feed kids kid food, which is ter uh, typically some of the most junkiest food that we have. Um, and uh, my little boy's been eating mushrooms since he had teeth and he has no opposition to eating mushrooms and vegetables and things like that as we've introduced it to him at a young age. A lot of people think that, oh, their kids, they're not going to want to eat this kind of stuff so they don't feed it to them or they tell them that they're not going to eat that um, or whatever, kind of building them up to be eating uh, ju junk type food. So that's just something I like to throw in there. Um, and that uh, mushroom is probably as big as his little head was in that picture. <laughs> um, here we have a chestnut mushroom, foliota adiposa. This is another great mushroom to grow in the cold weather. Um, this mushroom will fruit at like 55, 65 degrees. Um, and it has a nice stem. So um, one of the things with the mushrooms, a lot of mushrooms, the stem is not going to be um, the same texture as the cap. Um, the stem will typically be tougher. Um, so people typically separate them and use the stem for like mushroom broth and stock and things like that. But um, I've really been into just putting the whole mushroom into a food processor and then creating kind of like a ground mushroom with stems that are tough. But the foliota adiposa actually has a really um, tender stem. So that's one that you can use the stem and the cap together. Um, here we have the shimeji mushroom, the um, uh, beach mushroom. Um, so this one is Hypsozygous tessellatus and uh, mushrooms with really nice stems. It's sometimes good to grow them in high CO2 environments where the stem gets really long so you can eat the whole stem as well um, versus having the larger cap. So this is a really cool one to show people um, different varieties or ways that you can grow mushrooms um, to bring different things to market that aren't typically available. Um, so here we have one of my older gardens um, and a lot of people told me I wasn't gonna be able to grow food and wood chips and compost. They, everybody's like, you need to make finished soil. You need to have these soil mixes, da, 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 da. I read a book, I know what I'm talking about. And I was just like, well, I'm gonna have all these mushrooms in here, breaking down these um, carbon rich materials into uh, more nutrient dense food, compost for the plants. And as you can see, um, all these plants here are growing in wood chips and they're all green. They don't have any deficiencies of any sort. And um, uh, the beds underneath are completely filled with uh, mushroom mycelium. So I inoculated all these wood chips with a species called uh, wine cap or Schifferia rugosa onulata. And this was in a south facing yard. So it did get direct sunlight until the plants grew out. And as the plants leaves start to shade and retain moisture, um, then we started to get loads of mushrooms underneath the plants. So wow. kind of biotic relationship um, where we're capturing um, all of this carbon that would have gone to um, um, composting facilities where sometimes they're not even maintaining the compost and it's letting off methane um, to the point where we're sequestering the carbon, putting it in the soil, um, using mushrooms to break it down, using plants to uptake it and, and uh, cycle, through, cycle through that carbon. Um, and then it's giving us loads of delicious, nutritious, uh, nutraceutical type foods. So we have these Trefaria mushrooms here. Um, I typically get about $15 a pound for these. They have this really beautiful rustic look. Um, they'll kind of give you the itis like turkey if you eat too much of them. Um, and they taste like a mixture of like asparagus and potatoes. They're super delicious mushroom, uh, really great to work with, really great for anybody that's trying to grow out a garden. Um, uh, a lot of people will uh, do beds of wood chips, um, inoculate them with wine caps, wait about two or three years, and then the wood chips will be um, turning into soil. Then you can plant your plants right into it. But I'd literally just plant into them the next year and let the plants and mushrooms uh, co-mingle and coexist. Um, I also work with other mushrooms in the garden. So here we see the uh, golden oyster. So sometimes I'll just break up the spawn, spread it around the garden. And then when it rains, we get these massive blooms of mushrooms. So we call this passive mushroom farming. Um, you can literally just put 
loads and loads of mushroom blocks outside and you'll just see them start to fruit every time it rains and you literally don't have to do anything. Um, if you want to, um, you can just make a shade area or make a shaded greenhouse type situation and then just grow lots of mushrooms out there simply by spraying them with a hose. Um, that's a really, really easy way to grow mushrooms. So well, would you please define spawn for folks? Um, so spawn is basically um, the block of mycelium. Um, we call that spawn because you can use it to spawn into something else. So any of these blocks of mycelium that are uh, the, these wood or sawdust um, blocks of mycelium can be broken up and added into wood chips. They can be broken up and added into more um, uh, to straw. Um, typically people use grain spawn, which is just the grains. And just like I told you, um, the, the grains have so many inoculation points, you can just break that up and add it to so many things. Typically when we're working uh, indoors in more um, clean environments, we're going to uh, use grain spawn because if we're inoculating with grain spawn outside, then uh, bugs are typically uh, attracted to that. Um, but so, uh, sawdust spawn works really well because it's uh, not as nutrient rich. Um, so here we see um, some reishi mushrooms growing in one of my shade, uh, shaded environments. So really, really easy way to grow mushrooms. Um, what I did was I bought a carport. So just one of those little tent looking things that people park their cars under when they don't have a garage so it doesn't get rained on. Um, and it's kind of like a canvas plastic or uh, uh, synthetic material that shades out the area. Um, and then if you put it underneath a tree or something so it doesn't get beamed with direct sunlight, it'll stay nice and cool in there. And I literally just went in there and sprayed my mushroom bags with, with a hose and I got lots of mushrooms just to grow in that, in that area. So that's a really easy way, really cost effective way to start growing mushrooms. Um, here we see some log, a log at my friend's house and this one is semi-buried. This is Namako or Foliota, um, Foliota Namako. Um, and uh, this is just grown from a drilled log. So if any, I'm not gonna talk too much about drilling logs because um, almost everywhere in the US you can go take a log drilling workshop or um, lend a hand at a farm drilling logs. And I also have a video on my YouTube channel that you can go watch about drilling logs. Um, but basically you just drill holes and you introduce mushroom spawn into the holes. Um, and then certain mushrooms like reishi or foliota namako like being semi-buried. Um, as you see here, it's fruiting out and you can see it's all wet and rainy. These mushrooms are just popping out right out of the ground. So I really, really enjoy this passive mushroom gardening, passive mushroom farming, where you just kind of um, inoculate it and then leave it outside and then it produces really, really well for you. Um, and then child labor at the farmer's market. Um, more people sell to the little cute faces than they do for me. But um, Leo's been around and it's, uh, it's helped him develop an entrepreneurial spirit where he wants to start setting up things and selling his own things as well. So this is him at the farmer's market. You can see we have lion's mane we grew. We have shiitake that we bought from other farmers because um, I typically don't grow shiitake inside. I don't like growing shiitake inside. It makes a big mess. It takes longer for incubation. Um, you have to wait and let it grow this bark out on, on the mycelium. Um, and yeah, it just makes a big mess. So I like growing shiitakes more outdoors. And if I don't have shiitakes growing outdoors, I'll typically buy from other farmers, supporting local farmers, and then also increasing the diversity at my farmer's market. Um, and then we also have these oyster mushrooms. And then throughout the year, we'll have different mushroom products. And we'll also have um, uh, cultivate or uh, different wild foraged mushrooms. Um, so here's some of the wild foraged mushrooms. We have these beautiful chanterelles over here. Um, and then we also have these black trumpet mushrooms. So the black trumpet mushrooms are very powerful, aromatic mushroom, um, similar to a truffle, I like to say, in the way that you can use it as a flavor enhancer. Um, so it's very perfumey, super amazing, delicious gourmet mushroom. Then in the middle over here, we have these chicken of the woods mushrooms, which produce an abundance. Um, and a lot of people really, really like those because they taste kind of like chicken. So there's two different types of chicken of the woods. One is the Lady Porius sulfurius, um, or two different types on the East Coast, at least. Um, one of them is the Lady Porius sulfurius, which grows on trees. It grows on logs, has a yellow pores, um, and it can give people some gastrointestinal intestinal distress. Uh, has like a somewhat of a sulfur content. So some people say that they're allergic to it, but the white um, poor chicken of the woods that grows on the bottom of trees, that's Lady Poor Cincinnatus. More people have um, uh, better experiences eating that and it's more, uh, um, it doesn't give people any gastrointestinal distress at all. Um, so we'll get into a little bit of mushroom biology. A lot of these terms are more necessary if you're gonna be foraging mushrooms. So we see um, the calf, the umbo, like shiitake, sometimes we'll have this little, um, 
nipple like thing on the top of the cap. Some mushrooms have scales like shiitake have those like white um, scales on the top and the gills. And then some mushrooms have pores. We have the stem uh, ring or annulus like the um, uh, wine cap mushroom has the ring. And then some mushrooms grow out of a vulva or a cup like the stink horns or the classic amanita will grow out of a cup. And then most mushrooms or all mushrooms are connected by their mycelial threads that grow into whatever substrate that they grew out of. Um, so these terms are more necessary if you're going to be foraging. Um, and then how mushrooms grow really. Um, for basidiomycetes, which is the only real one I'm really going to talk about because there's a whole bunch of different ways that mushrooms produce spores, but most of the mushrooms that we're going to work with are basidiomycetes. So they produce these basidia, which look like little launching pads that the spores develop on and the gills are in the pores. The spores develop on there and then once they're large enough, they shoot out. Um, and sometimes they have like a little convection. So you'll see like the mushroom spores like landing on top of the mushroom, like on the reishi. Um, they drop the spores and then the spores do the genetic combination. So two spores will land on a patch of grass, they'll land in some moss, they'll land on a log, um, and they'll do this little love making situation out in the open in a beautiful area rather than a dark room, which I think we could learn a little bit from mushrooms. <laughs> um, but then they do their gen genetic combination and they grow out into mycelium. Once the mycelium has conquered its area, once it's grown through, or once it has some environmental stimulation, um, it'll start producing these little pins, which eventually blossom into mushrooms and then the whole cycle repeats over again. Um, so we'll get into low tech, no tech. We'll talk a little bit more about cultivation here. So low tech, no tech is an important micro resilient skill. It addresses low socioeconomic areas. Um, it's super efficient, efficient and it's an excellent teaching tool. So this is what I teach people when I travel um, and it's more low tech, no tech. Um, just due to the fact that it's really easily replicable for, for a low amount of uh, economic input. Um, so step one, if you're going to start growing mushrooms, you need to obtain a culture. Um, so when I first started growing mushrooms, I went out into the forest. Well, the first thing I did is I went to a grocery store and I cloned an oyster mushroom I found in the grocery store uh, onto a piece of cardboard, which again, you can find on my YouTube channel. Um, but eventually I started going out into the forest, started travel, uh, just driving around through the neighborhoods finding all the mushrooms that I wanted to grow. So oyster mushrooms, lion's mane, reishi, um, literally everything except for shiitake or like wild exotic types I could find growing around here that I could uh, clone and then grow in my house. So cloning mushrooms are as simple as just breaking it open, taking a piece of the tissue and putting it on cardboard. Or if you're uh, savvy enough with lab skills, you can start putting them on Petri dishes and then expanding them out. All right guys, so here we are. In the lab, we have some fruited cordyceps. Um, so what I'm gonna be doing is doing an example or a demonstration of cloning cordyceps and then also starting cordyceps from spore. Um, so the cloning concepts will work just as well for wild uh, cordyceps mushrooms, but the spore culture is not gonna work as well for wild cordyceps mushrooms. And the reason being is that the wild cordyceps mushrooms have all sorts of molds and things like that, and they're really prone to uh, penicillin and trichodermal mold growing on the parathecium. Um, which we'll go over during the presentation what the parathecium actually is. Uh, but right now we're going to just go ahead and get started with this cloning. So these jars, they've been sitting out in the fruiting room. You're just going to want to make sure it's all sterile on the outside before you crack it open. Um, again, you're always going to want to make sure that your workspace is also clean. Um, whenever we're working in front of the flow, uh, when we spray with alcohol, we want to make sure that we're always wiping towards us. That way that we're not wiping any bacteria around. And then I just throw my materials on the floor and pick that up later, worry about that later. Um, so we have some Petri dishes here. Uh, they're pre-made. Um, and this is just a simple agar recipe. It's just uh, one liter of coconut water to 25 grams of agar, and that's it. So that works out really, really well. Cordyceps love it. Um, occasionally when I do some pre-made dishes, we might get a little contamination. So I'm just gonna get that one out of here. And we're gonna, we have these nice dishes to work with here. Um, so the first thing I'm gonna do is a clone. So we're gonna pop this out. There you go, we have a beautiful cordyceps mushroom here. I'll show you guys that right now. That's a beautiful, nice uh, cultivated cordyceps there. Um, so we're gonna go ahead, sterilize our needle, make sure my hands are sprayed. And when you're working with alcohol with the fresh cordyceps, you're gonna to wanna to make sure that you're not spraying the cordyceps directly with alcohol while they're on there. Um, you can deactivate their spore production. Um, you could potentially ruin the inside of the culture as well if the alcohol sinks through. Um, so now this is a little bit hot. 
I'm gonna use this Petri dish to cool down the scalpel. Um, I had just had the scalpel in the back disintegrator. Some people might use a blowtorch, some people might use an alcohol lamp. I use the back disintegrator to make sure that my tools are nice and sterile. Um, and ideally, um, if you're gonna be talking, you're gonna wanna cover your face with some sort of mask, um, but the flow is strong enough that me talking is not gonna blow onto the cordyceps mushrooms. So I'm gonna go ahead and get this nice fat one right there. It's a nice big guy. Um, if you're getting them from the wild, it might, you might not always have the uh, opportunity to work with fat mushrooms, so it might be a little skinnier, which is a little bit more difficult. You might want to get a tool, something like a, uh, something like a dental pick. All right, so what we're going to do, we're going to move this guy out of the way, and you're either going to use um, uh, hydrogen peroxide, which might be a little bit better for this situation, or you're going to use alcohol to spray the outside. But if you're going to do this, you want to spray it from pretty high up. Make sure it doesn't sink through the whole mushroom. And this is more, more important for wild cordyceps. It's not so much important for this because it's been sterile inside this jar the whole time. I'm going to go ahead and rip this guy open. You can see there's fresh uh, tissue in there. Again, we're going to sterilize the scalpel. We're going to use that scalpel to get some of this fresh tissue out. If you see that it's saturated in the inside from the hydrogen peroxide or the alcohol you used, um, you, you have less potential to get a strong culture out of there. So again, I'm gonna cool down the scalpel there. And you can see I always keep the lid above the Petri dish to make sure nothing else is falling in there, but I just moved it to show you guys that I'm just sterilizing the scalpel. And I'm gonna go in there and cut out a segment of inner tissue. You don't need much. So there we go, we have a little piece of tissue. And I'm just gonna slide that right onto the Petri dish. And um, what we'll do now is we'll grab some of our parafilm. We'll rip a couple, a couple tabs of that off. Peel that off and then use the side that was touching the paper to go across and seal up our dish here. Now that we have that sealed up, I'm gonna put clone. Today is April 10th, so I'm gonna put the 10th. Um, and we'll just leave it like that. I know it's cordyceps, because that's really the only thing I'm cloning right now, but if you wanna get more in depth, you can put uh, more details there. So I'll set that aside. Um, and then this, you can make tea with it if you want to. I mean, really, I don't really use those once, they're, once they've been used for cloning. And then again, I'm gonna just wipe towards me. And what we're gonna do next is I'm gonna show you guys how to get a spore culture. And also make sure you don't leave your tools in the back incinerator. But um, I'm gonna show you guys how to make a spore culture now. So I have this petroleum jelly that I only use in the lab. Um, you can get Waxaline. Uh, if you don't want to support the petroleum industry, you can get a uh, petroleum jelly type product that's made from beeswax. Um, and it works just as well. Um, so I'm going to take this, again, cool it down. And I'm going to find a nice, like straight cordyceps mushroom that has some nice parathesium on it. You don't want anything that's curved because we're gonna be sticking the mushroom to the top of the Petri dish. If it's curved, it might dip into the Petri dish. So I'm gonna go ahead, and just cut this guy off. Oh, more, got more than I bargained for there, but that's okay. I'm just gonna cut it. This one's nice and straight. This is a nice specimen that we're gonna use here. And um, all we're gonna do is take a little bit of petroleum jelly and we're gonna put the petroleum jelly on the top of the mushroom and we're gonna use that petroleum jelly to stick this mushroom to the top of the petri dish. Set that right in there. Then over the next 24 to 48 hours, spores are gonna drop out of the parathesium onto the dish and then eventually we'll get a nice culture. Um, this one you can see I was traveling so I didn't have the opportunity to take the mushroom off But you can see all this mycelium that's grown from the spores from this little mushroom on the top So ideally you're gonna want to take the mushroom off of the dish after about 24 to 48 hours Whenever you see some white spores dropped onto the petri dish 
So again, we're just gonna go ahead and cover this guy up with some parafilm. What are the benefits of cloning versus forest? Um, I will only really clone mush cordyceps mushrooms if they're wild. Um, if, if they're in culture, I already have that culture. So if I clone it, it doesn't really do anything beneficial for me because I already have it. So um, I only do clones from wild. So that demonstration was just showing you how I would clone a wild cordyceps. But from culture, I only do spores because the spores start a whole new culture that I don't have. Um, so once the spores combine, it's, it's new genetics. Um, so I'm going to put... Uh, spore drop, and then the date, and then again, I'll open, I'll spray alcohol on this, open it up, remove the cordyceps in about 24 to 48 hours, um, and then the culture will just grow out in there, and then I can isolate um, anything that looks really good, and then potentially fruit that out. Um, all right, so. Then these cordyceps then could just be set aside and you can harvest them um, later on. So I'm gonna put those off to the side and um, we really don't need these petri dishes so I'll set those off to the side as well. What I can show you guys now, oops, forgot about that. What I can show you guys now is a liquid culture, how to make a liquid culture. So we have this uh, culture grown out here. I'm gonna go ahead and spray this down with alcohol. I'm gonna spray the top of this um, with alcohol. And if anybody needs any reference on how to make liquid cultures, you can check out the YouTube channel, Apex Grower. That's my YouTube channel, where I have two part, a two-part video on how I make these liquid cultures. So you guys can utilize that for reference. I'm gonna go ahead and open this up. I'm gonna sterilize my syringe. And while that's in there, I'm gonna open the cap of this liquid culture. Take the syringe, again, we're gonna cool it down in the Petri dish. Now I'm gonna open this one. And I'm just gonna cut three lines and I'm gonna make a bunch of little squares and I'm gonna take out as many as I can and just pop them right into the liquid culture. Close it on up, swish it around. i pull this guy off because it doesn't need to be on there anymore. Liquid or Petri dish? Um, the Petri dish, once it reaches the edge, I mean, you, if, if you keep it in a colder, like in the free refrigerator or something like that, um, you could probably keep it for like four months. Um, if you put it on a slant and then keep it in a proper fridge, um, you can keep it for like a couple years. But cordyceps cultures will senesce, which means they'll just get to a point where they're not going to really fruit anymore. And they'll do that after like six to nine months. Um, so you got to keep keep producing new cordyceps cultures, just like I showed you. Um, so what I did is I took a piece of this petri dish and put it into a new one, just in case anything happened or if that maybe potentially got contaminated. And again, with the parafilm to just seal it up. advantage of agriculture or liquid culture? Liquid culture is way cleaner because with liquid culture, the only time you're ever going to open a liquid culture jar is if you're putting a petri dish in it. So I'll show you one more way to make a liquid culture. Um, I'm just going to label this and all I did was put cool spore. That's what I named it. You can really name it whatever you want. Then put the date. So I'm just going to put CS on this and then the date. There's a little alcohol in there. Well, it's not really gonna work right now. My, my Sharpie has alcohol on it. There we go, CS410, just the date. 
And um, I'll set that over with some more liquid cultures, set these petri dishes aside. And I'll show you guys one more method of making a liquid culture. So here we have another empty liquid culture. And if you guys order your cultures from my, my web store, mycoshop.net, um, you'll typically get a 10cc syringe. Here we have a 60cc uh, syringe, which we'll use sometimes for inoculating because it has more liquid in it. Um, but if you get a syringe from me, you can make your own liquid culture. And this is one of the reasons why liquid cultures are cleaner. So you never have to even work with Petri dishes. You can just take the syringe, stick it in there, the one that you get from me on microshop.net, and just squirt a couple cc's of liquid in there. And now you have a new liquid culture. You just have to let this sit for about a week and you'll start to see mycelium floating in the liquid culture. Um, so I'll just label that CMB and then the date 410. And there you go. I mean, liquid cultures can be as easy as that. And the reason that that's so clean is the only point of contamination is this little tiny needle tip, which I sterilized before I put it in there. And you can also do that with a Bic lighter um, and then just keep, keep the top clean by spraying alcohol on it. Um, and there's really no point where you're ever opening the culture where it might potentially become contaminated. Um, one other way that's a little bit more advanced is you can actually um, make a liquid culture with just sterile sugar water. Um, you can use an empty syringe, suck up the sterile sugar water, and then actually poke the syringe through a mushroom, and there'll be a little tiny piece of the mushroom in the syringe, which you can then suck up and actually clone a mushroom just with liquid culture, which is actually really clean if you can get that method down. Um, so that's what I have to show you guys as far as the lab goes. Um, other than that, um, all we really do, once we, once we have a liquid culture, uh, we'll create our rice substrate, um, which I'll go over during our presentation. Um, but we create our rice substrate, uh, we add our nutritious broth, we run it through a sterilizer, um, and then we take our liquid culture of mycelium and sterilize it, and then just simply stick the needle through the lid of the jar and introduce the liquid culture, which then grows out and will produce the beautiful mushrooms um, over the period of about six weeks. So if you're doing this every week, uh, maybe a couple times a week, you'll get to the point where you're harvesting mushrooms every week, which is ideal if you want it for some kind of business. If not, if you're just doing it for yourself, um, you could just do it every now and then and get a nice crop of cordyceps mushrooms. Um, so uh, for additional techniques, just refer to the presentation uh, or refer to the cordyceps cultivation handbook and um, I hope you guys have a lot of success with, with growing cordyceps. If you don't want to do all that, you can buy uh, mushroom cultures from online vendors. Um, I sell mushroom cultures online. Soon my library will be back up like it used to be with all sorts of different cultures. Um, and, uh, and you can just, liquid cultures are probably going to be the best bet for beginners. They're really easy. They're not like petri dishes where you don't have to open them all the time, exposing them to potential contamination. Um, you can just take the liquid culture, put it into uh, sterile grains, and you never really have to open anything. So I really like working with liquid cultures. Um, spawn versus cultures. You can also buy spawn. So if you're going to be um, inoculating oysters onto uh, straw, you can just buy a bag of oyster sawdust spawn um, online from the various vendors and then just break that up and introduce it into pasteurized straw, um, which we'll talk about pasteurization here moving forward in a little bit. Um, so a lot, of, a lot of mushroom farmers don't even have laboratories. They'll just buy spawn from other people um, and expand it out or just buy spawn and fruit it out. Um, culture is usually referred to a small living uh, fungus growing on a petri dish or floating in an aquaceous solution or a slant. So that's like the liquid culture, a petri dish or a slant. Um, and then tissue culture refers to a sample of tissue from a mushroom body or fungus. So you only really do tissue culture when you're cloning. Um, so here on the left, we see what the liquid cultures look like. They, we just sell them in syringes. Um, you sterilize the little needle tip and then you can stick it into whatever um, sterile material that you're gonna be inoculating. On the right, we have Petri dishes with the mycelium completely grown out. Um, uh, and that's kind of like the old school way. I mean, still a lot of people use, the only, the only time I really use Petri dishes are for cloning and for starting spore cultures. Otherwise, I'm always using uh, liquid cultures. Um, so using a clean environment. So when I first started out, I was just working inside of this box on the left. 
I would put long dishwashing gloves on and I would just work inside of the still air box. And this keeps things from falling down into your work and you can actually do sterile work inside of this small box. Eventually I upgraded to uh, this HEPA filter where you can work in front of the HEPA filter and it'll clean the air in the room and also blow any possible contaminants out of the way um, from your Petri dishes or whatever work you're doing in front of it. Um, agar. So if you're going, if you are going to work with agar, um, I just go to the store and buy this telephone brand agar from the Asia mall uh, or any Asian store. Um, they're super cheap. They're like a dollar per bag. Um, they're 25 grams in there. And then the easiest agar recipe that I've ever done is just mixing one liter of coconut water with 25 grams of agar and then sterilizing it. And that's it. So you don't have to add any other materials or anything, any other ingredients. The coconut water has enough nutrition for the, um, for the mushrooms. Um, so for beginners, I really recommend uh, making your agar and sterilizing it in these um, little jars um, so you don't have to pour it. That's one less time that you have to open it. So if you sterilize it in a big jar and you buy these Petri dishes, you're going to have to pour it uh, into the Petri dishes in front of a, in a sterile area while the liquid is still warm. So that's one potential time for contamination where you're opening it, you're pouring it in, you close it, then you have to open it again to put a mushroom culture in, you close it, let it grow, then you have to open it again to take it out. So you really wanna eliminate as many times as you're opening it. And that's one of the reasons why I really prefer liquid culture. Um, so sterilizing media, you can literally use like any pressure can or any pressure cooker to sterilize your grains or your agar or whatever. Um, but pressure cookers and pressure canners will, uh, because of the pressure will sterilize. So when you're getting up to the bigger things like sawdust and straw and things like that you're going to want to pasteurize because you're going to be wanting to use a lot of material and you can't fit so much material in, into little pressure cookers um, the next step, step up if you're going to go really commercial and spend a bunch of money would be a big autoclave like a giant autoclave um, that can do like hundreds of, of bags at a time but for people that are going to be um, just growing commercial scale for like farmers markets and things like that. That's not something that's going to be feasible as far as money goes. So pasteurizing is going to work, which we'll talk about here moving forward. Um, so pouring agar, this is just an example of what it looks like to pour agar. And again, this is something I really don't like to do, um, but I do it anyways for clones and spore cultures and things like that. Um, you want to want to keep your tool sterile inside of your laboratory um, by either using an alcohol lamp to flame your scalpel or your, um, your needle tips. Um, or a back disintegrator, which you see on the right, which you can get very uh, uh, cheap on eBay used. Um, and you can just stick your tools in there and sterilize them. You can also use a butane torch or anything like that, but you just want to use heat to sterilize any metal tools that you're going to be using. Um, then making the cut as far as cloning glo goes, um, you just rip open the mushroom and you can go back and uh, check out the footage that we got. Um, but you open the mushroom, take a little piece of clean tissue out and uh, put it onto your Petri dish. And then this is what it looks like under a microscope when the mycelium jumps out of the um, piece of tissue that you put in there. So the mycelium grows out um, and then you can then uh, expand that mycelium to grow that mushroom out further. And this is what it looks like under a microscope, the mycelium all growing out, just these little networks with little nuclei bouncing all around. Super, super intelligent organism. Um, and then we have um, the mycelium starting out and then growing out radially. Um, ideally, you're going to want to start to expand it before it reaches the ends because the ends are going to be the dirtiest part of the Petri dish. Um, so yeah, propagate and myceliate. Once you have your culture, the next thing would be to uh, propagate it to a new substrate and let it grow through. Um, propagation means to start from the parent culture and then the propagation phase can, can take on many faces because um, you can literally propagate your mycelium into anything that it that's organic. You can grow it on cotton pants, you can grow it on cardboard boxes, old pizza boxes, um, paper, old shoes, um, anything that's made from an organic material, um, you can grow your, your mycelium on. So lots of different potentials there. A lot of people do like the coffee grounds, you can go to local cafes, grab coffee grounds, grow mushrooms on it. Um, um, I've seen people grow them on corn cobs. I've seen people grow them on hemp. I've actually done an experiment with uh, growing mushrooms on old hemp stalks that you just shred up in a, in a chipper um, and that works really well. So just think of like high lignin, high cellulose materials that you can grow your mushrooms on. Um, Does the substrate impact the flavor of the mushrooms? 
Not really. Um, I mean, I do prefer log-grown shiitakes over like sawdust shiitake, but um, if it's the same strain, it's typically going to be the same flavor uh, um, as far as the mushrooms. Even on coffee grounds, huh? Yep. I mean, like you might smell a little bit of the coffee grounds, but it doesn't really change the flavor too much. Hmm. Um, Yeah, so uh, um, sterilization and pasteurization. Um, A lot of people say don't use pressure canners, but you can definitely use pressure canners. No big deal. Um, they work really great. Um, I've used pressure canners for years. Um, now I have the big, uh, sterilizers, which work really well. Um, and then low pressure and no pressure pasteurization techniques that have been developed in Asia are definitely catching on really quickly over here. Um, which I'll show you guys, uh, here we go. Um, so here's like a pressure canner and then a pressure sterilizer. Um, you can get the sterilizer from the all American, uh, company. They make the company is literally just called all American and they make these sterilizers. Um, and then we have these pressure canners that you can just go buy at any hardware store. Um, on the bottom left, um, we have a bag of hydrated lime in a barrel. So, um, with, with the hydrated lime, it, it just raises the pH of the material. And you can do this with, um, hardwood fuel pellets or straw. So if you get, shredded straw or hardwood fuel pellets. You just put them in a big container full of water. Um, you add the hydrated lime, which I don't know the ratio off the top of my head, but you can easily find online. Um, but the hydrated lime will raise the pH and then about eight hours or just let it sit overnight. The pH will go back down and um, you can then have a small window of time to um, inoculate that. So you'll take it out of the water, let it drain off, um, and then introduce your other mushroom spawn to and then put it in buckets or bags or anything like that that you want to grow it out of. Um, and that's a great way of pasteurization. Um, there's also like a fermentation pasteurization where you just let your material soak in water for about a week. Um, and then all of the microbes on it are going to be uh, anaerobic. And as soon as you take it out, they'll all die from the oxygen and you'll have another small window time of, of inoculation. Um, and then on the right here, uh, we have this barrel with a propane tank underneath of it, uh, or a propane burner. So uh, this one, you don't, I mean, it's kind of rusty. I bought it used, that's not ideal because this one eventually caught on fire, Um, but you can, yeah. um, I really recommend the Bayou Classic brand. Um, Bayou Classic makes these turkey fryers, um, which you can put underneath your barrel, prop up your barrel with, um, with these cinder blocks. And then inside of the barrel, you're gonna put some cinder blocks at the very bottom. So you'll just put, like one layer of cinder blocks at the bottom, and then you'll pour water up to an inch below this, the top of the cinder blocks. Um, and then once you turn the heat on, it kind of acts like similar to a pressure cooker or a steamer. So that water will create steam. Um, and then you can put racks in. I was originally using these plastic racks, which would melt after like four or five times being used, but my friend was, um, um, he, he was giving these to me, but eventually I just bought uh, steel, stainless steel uh, grill grates um, that were the same diameter as the barrel. So I can lower these grill grates in, put a couple um, stacks of, of my mushroom bags in there. And the bags that we use, um, I use bags from the Unicorn Company. So it's called Unicorn Bags. Um, and they're bags that are meant for mushroom cultivation. They now have biodegradable ones that the plastic is um, uh, a type of plastic that can resist high heat without melting. And that's, uh, that's really rare. That's a really new development just for folks that are listening. So you do have the option now to be able to use biodegradable plastic, which is phenomenal. Yep. So um, we lower those, those racks in. We put the mushroom bags in there. And then you can see there's a towel on the top. And um, then I put the lid on. And then I put usually four or five cinder blocks on top. And the cinder blocks add pressure. So the steam's trying to escape, the cinder blocks are on top, it's creating pressure in there. But if you create pressure and close it, like if you put the clamp on and there's no way for the pressure to be released, you can explode the the barrel or the barrel top can fly off. Um, So by putting this towel here and not putting the clamp on, if steam wants to escape, it'll escape through the wet towel because the towel will get wet from steam and then if there's too much pressure, the steam will just shoot out of the side. So this is a low pressure pasteurization technique or super pasteurization as some people call it. Um, So you're gonna want a non-galvanized food grade steel drum, wet seal with a towel, 
propane burner and cinder blocks, and you can go ahead and start um, doing these low, low pressure pasteurizations. And typically I'll run that for about uh, eight to 12 hours. Um, I'll typically just let one 20 pound propane burner burn out on it. So it's like nine to $12 for 20 pounds of propane. Um, and then you just let that run. And then each bag is worth a minimum of $25. Um, so it definitely pays for itself when you can get like 30 bags in there. Um, eventually moving forward, as I get back into gourmet cultivation, as I've only been cultivating cordyceps for a couple years now, um, I'm going to set up a, uh, um, what is it called? A gasification mach machine. So um, you can put in like wood chips, you can put in pellets, whatever you want to do. Um, it burns them in a closed system. The uh, solid material turns into biochar, but it also captures the gas, um, which is can be used as a burnable gas. Um, and then you can use that instead of propane and that become, makes it a little bit more sustainable. Do systems like that exist or are you going to be constructing your own? Um, they ex I don't know anybody that's selling them. I'm sure you can buy gasification machines that somebody like pre prefabricates. It's probably pretty expensive. Um, but there's a lot of like blueprints online on how to make them. Um, FEMA even has uh, one on their website to make a gasification machine to make like your own charcoal and burnable gas if there's ever like a disaster situation or something. Um, but yeah, I mean, having biochar and like free burnable gas, that's incredible. Um, or you can just like do like a biodigester, but it'll probably take a lot of fermentation to make enough um, methane for you to be burning all the time like that. But still worth a shot if you want to create a sustainable loop. Um, so once you have the sterilized material, um, you can inoculate it with your grain spawn. And you can see all the different little dots here are individual grains that are connecting with each other. Um, <clears throat> and just like I said, you can put it on literally anything that's organic. So I grow them sometimes on like wet paper towels and, and um, paper, paper towel rolls, toilet paper rolls, newspaper, junk mail, all sorts of things. Um, and I'll grow the mycelium on it and then put it outside, inoculate them into wood chips um, so that I'm composting my own uh, materials that I get. I mean, I know everybody gets junk mail and you can't really throw anything away. There is no way. So um, you might as well just compost it and use it to, for your own benefit. Um, so then get myceliated uh, eventually um, after you inoculate, it'll be all closed in with the mycelium. And at that point, you can then grow your mushrooms. Do you, um, so put, any, do you put any kind of holes in the bags at all? Um, I do put holes once they're fully grown. Um, otherwise, like the bags that you buy from Unicorn, they have filters on them. Um, but once they're ready to grow mushrooms, I'll pop holes in the bag for the mushrooms to grow out. Um, and then every mushroom has its own unique environmental preferences for fruiting. Some mushrooms enjoy similar fruiting conditions. So you can grow like oysters, lions, main shiitake, things like that all in the same grow room. Um, and then using perma permaculture and biomimicry, we can try and understand the natural environments if we're collecting them from the wild and then growing them out so we can create better fruiting conditions. And then modular fruiting is always ideal. So like I always recommend start small till you get the hang of it, then slowly grow up bigger and bigger in like a modular type system. Um, here's another picture of the outdoor setup that we had where you can literally just um, put chain link fence. Can you see my mouse? I do, yes. Yeah, so you can put chain link fence leaned up on the top of these bars and then like lean them down and you can just put mushroom blocks the whole way up the chain link fence and have them fruiting all off the side and that's a really great way to fruit mushrooms in, in a system like this. Um, and you can see again more mushrooms, grow, or mycelium growing through paper. Um, so um, that's pretty much as far as the cultivation part will go, but I'll just talk a little bit more about mushrooms in general. Um, mushrooms are nature's immune system. Um, I like to think as above, so below. Um, I've seen a lot of like replication of human systems when I look at mushroom mycelium. Um, and then, I mean, from the smallest like uh, um, mushroom system looks like the mycelium looks like the internet. So um, if we take this back over here, all these little individual threads as they reach out are like your cell phone or your computer there. Um, we're finding information, we're putting, we're loading information into the internet on our computers, we're taking pictures, sharing them on Instagram, sharing them on Facebook, and the whole network has access to that information. Um, and we see this on the smallest scale of, of fungi, but literally this same structure is the structure of dark matter in the universe. Um, so I mean, this mycelial uh, um, um, archetype has, is seen from like the small scale of, of life to the larger scales of life. Um, so they have comprehensive functions. Um, so I'll get a little heady for a minute, but I, I do personally believe that 
Um, algae and fungi are the alpha and omega of biology. Um, algae being the first photosynthesizer or cyanobacteria, which is classified as like a type of algae, being the first photosynthesizer and then fungi being the first decomposer. So they've been creating in, in uh, uh, life and systems since for billions of years, uh, literally billions of years. They've survived every single mass extinction and they're there every time after mass extinction to create biomass and then break it down to store energy in the soil to help life start over again after mass extinctions. And we even see algae and fungi growing together as lichens and then also algae and fungi just growing on the outside of the space station. So I think anywhere that there is biological life, there is algae and fungi. Um, and I think that there are some of the seed, like the seeding organisms or like the bee, like, I don't know, grand composers of, of biological systems um, in the universe. Um, and when we think about the way that fungi works in ecosystems, fungi have associations with other organisms. Like fungi always need some other organism to survive, whether it's a plant, whether they need to grow on the plant roots or whether they need the plant to die to grow on on the uh, plant material or whether it's an animal, they need to grow on the animal's uh, excrement or they need to grow inside of the animal's uh, intestinal tract. Um, uh, there's always some association with another organism. And because of that, the fungi are actively uh, working to protect the organisms that they have associations with. So they do this by like deterring pathogenic organisms that are pathogenic to those uh, uh, relationships and encouraging beneficial bacteria and other beneficial fungi. So if you take that back to like the beginning of, of sing, uh, single cellular life evolving on our planet, as fungi are protecting the organisms that they have associations with and deterring other ones, they kind of been composing an ecosystem of, or composing a, a symphony of life or, uh, as they've been like ch helping to choose which organisms get to evolve through different ecosystems. Um, so dealing with the same environmental stresses, fungi develop enzyme and acid cocktails as well as unique molecular compounds that show, have been shown to be antimicrobial. Um, so it's really good to eat um, wild mushrooms from your environment because they're more acclimated to like the diseases and things that are going around. And there's actually, um, in the past 10 years, there's been a new super taxon called Epistacantha, which is part of the uh, evolutionary tree of life that shows that animalia evolved off of the branch of fungi some hundred millions of years ago. Um, which shows that we, sh we share a common ancestor, which is pretty incredible. Um, mycofiltration. Um, so mycofiltration is a branch of, bio of microremediation. It's the only branch of microremediation that I've really delved into. Um, I have a lot of friends that are more into microremediation than I am. But this simple system is uh, wine cap mushrooms, which are really good at breaking or taking care of uh, bi bacterial contaminations. Um, so I had squirrels that were pooping on my on my roof and I was collecting rainwater and there was E. coli in my rainwater. So I used this system which has holes in the top to filter the rainwater through these wood chips that has the mycelium in it. And then at the bottom I would test the, the water to see um, if the uh, E. coli had been removed. And then after a couple runs of filtering the water through the wood chips, the E. coli levels were completely reduced or almost gone com uh, completely. So there are different ways and like everything's not plug and play. It really depends on your environment and what you're dealing with. Um, but there are all sorts of different microremediation and microfiltration and all sorts of ways that you can use fungi for remediating ecosystems. Um, and then soil creation. So if you're gonna grow mushrooms, you're, you're essentially becoming a composter. Like you're, doing large-scale fermentation and composting. You're always gonna end up with soil at the end of it. Fungi are actively processing organic compounds into base elements in complex microbial societies creating soil. So we can work with fungi and microherd soil organisms to recreate these processes. Um, energy cycling. Energy is captured by the sun. It's converted into chemical energy. Nutrient energy is absorbed and then converted. Plants, they drop their leaves, they drop fruit, they drop dead. Fungi thrive, allowing the energy to be released into the soil and recycled. These are like building blocks of life. I mean, this has been happening for so many millions of years that we literally have fossil reserves of biological energy that for some reason the mass population thinks is better than all the energy that's being dumped on us every day by the sun. But uh, I think we'll evolve past that at some point. Um, but whenever we're foraging mushrooms, we typically find worms and we find beetles and all sorts of things like this on our mushrooms. Um, why not introduce these things into our system? So there's a lot, I have a lot of friends that are becoming really interested in um, eating insects. So like there's people that think that 
um, insect protein is going to save the world from the the terror that is mass cattle farming. Um, I don't think that mushrooms are going to save the world. I don't think that insects are going to save the world. I don't think that algae is going to save the world. I think that a combination of everything, uh, all these people incorporating these sustainable and ethical systems is what's going to save the world. But I do think it's important that people like hyper focus on one thing uh, because not everybody's going to want to play with insects or not everybody's going to want to play with mushrooms or algae or permaculture or whatever. Um, so everybody has to have their niche. But I do think that there are points where everything uh, correlates or, or interconnects. I mean, that's how nature works. Nature is one grand system. There is nothing that's a separate uh, part of it. Um, so I started to incorporate all these insects with my mushrooms for composting mostly. Um, when I first started out, everybody was working with these red wiggler worms, which you can see the sawdust at the top here is being broken down into this soil. Um, with these worms. So we'll add a little bit of sand because worms have like a crop, um, like chickens, they need a little bit of grit to break things down, but they also need, um, they also need beneficial soil microorganisms. Um, so when I, what I found out when I was feeding them these sterile mushroom blocks is that it took a long time. And like after they had gone through it once, then they started to break it down. So my friend Kurt started taking the mushroom blocks and he would inoculate them with uh, compost tea. So he would take, Worms produce this like tea, they produce this liquid that comes out of their, their bins. Um, and it's like a concentrate of uh, beneficial microorganisms. So you could take those beneficial microorganisms and then uh, expand them in bins by adding sugar and bubbling it. Um, so you can create these compost teas that you then inoculate your sawdust with. And then when you feed it to the worms, they rip through it like a hundred times faster. Um, and we also um, started working with the beetles and we worked with specific beetles like the darkling beetles that people like to eat their larvae, the mealworms and things like that. Um, uh, so we grew the mushroom, we grew the mealworms on different mushroom species and found out that the mealworms will taste different depending on which mushroom species they grow on. So that, that's something that's really interesting for people that are like really getting into eating bugs. Um, how do you, uh, just real quick, how do you prepare mealworms? Um, all sorts of ways. I mean, they're really like airy and crunchy. So, I mean, it's not something that you would use like a meat alternative per se. I mean, like they're really high in protein, but like, they're not like, they're too, they're more crunchy than meat is. So, I mean, I've made like mealworm tacos before at one of my micro herding classes. Um, but I don't have as much experience as like other, other friends. Um, there's like a whole bunch of people you can follow on Instagram that like all they do is work with insects. All they do is farm insects like Entomo. Um, they're a really cool one to follow. Um, so yeah, uh, mineral mining with fungi. Minerals are essential to our health. Mushrooms are able to hyperaccumulate minerals from our environments and materials that we feed them. Um, so you got to think because of monocrop agriculture, a lot of our soil has been depleted of, of beneficial minerals and nutrients. If you're ever driving down a country road and you see um, rivers of like brown water flowing down the roads, that's like minerals and nutrients being washed away from the soils. Um, plant or uh, uh, trees are able to get their roots down deep enough to accumulate more minerals and then the mushrooms grow on the trees and hyper accumulate those minerals uh, essentially making them like a supplement we can also add like um, rock dust azomite gypsum and things like that to our mushroom substrates to increase the mineral content as well um, then we get into foraging for health um, i personally believe that humans are like the ultimate scientific tool um, I believe that we're more acclimated to understanding symbols rather than auditory language. And I believe nature is just pure symbols. Biological nature is pure symbols. Um, Terrence McKenna had a really cool quote um, that DNA is protein syntax uttering itself into existence. It's literally a language of life. Um, so whenever I go out in the forest, I see the trees, I see the plants, I see the mushrooms, the animals as DNA that's perfectly uttering itself into the environment that it exists in, um, that it's a symbol showing the, some sort of function in a larger system. So you can go out there and essentially read nature and then you walk right to the mushrooms almost every time um, when you understand where they'll be um, by, by having that kind of relationship with nature. Um, the act of forging mushrooms in itself is a super powerful medicine. You get great cardio, beneficial inoculations from these antidepressant soil microorganisms. Um, get a better understanding of local topography, 
better understanding of natural patterns, and then wild mushrooms contain compounds against local, uh, effective against local pathogens. So we have this like Herisium corloides in my hands there. It kind of looks like a brain, and again, it's part of the Herisium genus or lion's mane type mushroom um, that's beneficial for your brain. So again, with the symbols, we have the the um, cordyceps that look like like uh, adrenal glands that are uh, beneficial for your adrenals. We have the reishi that looks like a liver, which is beneficial for liver detoxification, so on and so forth with the symbols of nature. Um, at the top left, we have honey mushrooms, which are parasitic type mushrooms, something you're not gonna wanna cultivate, but it's super delicious edible mushroom um, that you can make really good jerky with. Bottom left, we have uh, the chicken of the woods, lady poor sulfurious, the sulfur shelf mushroom. Um, top right, we have the maitake mushroom, which is really, really, uh, abundant in Pennsylvania in this uh, fall time, which I'll talk a little bit about more. In the bottom right, we have the cauliflower mushroom. Um, so some people are cultivating the chicken of the woods, keeping that to themselves. Um, there, has, there isn't much sharing of that information just yet. Um, and a lot of people are cultivating maitake. It's just a little bit harder to cultivate, but super delicious. Um, here we have shaggy mane mushrooms. This is a great potential can, can, uh, candidate for um, uh, microremediation. This is really good at remediating soils. If you find these, um, uh, Caprinus comatis, shaggy mane mushrooms, you can take a bunch of them, blend them up, put them in a watering can, and then water your soil with them, water your front lawn, and then you potentially might get these mushrooms growing out in the next six to nine months, or even in the next year, those mushrooms will grow in your front lawn, or in your back lawn, or whatever. They'll just grow right through the grass. Um, and yeah, again, they're really good for remediating soil. They're also pretty delicious, but they have this auto digestion uh, mechanism because they don't open their caps all the way, so they digest themselves and turn into a puddle um, within a couple of days. So they're not the best for selling uh, retail. Here we have the birch polypore, which grows on birch trees. This is uh, Phobis spectralina. Um, it used to be Piptopora spectralinus, so those were my Piptopora eyes, but now it's not funny anymore because they changed the name. Um, next to it, we have Agaricus campestris. This is a mushroom that came to the United States from Europe, from cattle. Um, the cattle brought the mushrooms over in their stomachs, and then when they pooped in the fields, um, then these mushrooms started growing. So we get these in the country in York um, in uh, Lancaster, Pennsylvania. Super delicious, super sexy cousin of the button mushrooms that we find in the stores. Bottom right, we have the uh, Antiloma abortivum. That is the aborted Antiloma or, uh, um, yeah, it's pretty much the only two names, but this is a parasite on a parasite. So it, it, affects, it infects the honey mushrooms that are killing trees. It grows on them and creates these um, shrimp of the woods is what people call them. Um, here we have chaga. This is one of the more powerful antioxidants in the world. Uh, chaga and chocolate are the two most powerful antioxidants in the world. And this one grows on birch trees in Northern territories or in high elevations in Southern territories. Um, and it's basically just infect, fungally infected wood. It's not really a mushroom, but again, super powerful antioxidant. Uh, here we have the Flemulina volutipes. This is the wild enoki. So typically in cultivation, we see these white with long stems and very small caps, but when they're grown in high oxygen environments and in the sunlight, they are very golden brown and have really nice open caps. So there's two different ways that we can grow these types of mushrooms. Or multiple ways, we can actually grow them in high CO2 with light and then we get long stem brown enokis um, or in high oxygen environments with no light and then get regular looking uh, um, white enoki. So lots of ways to play around with your mushrooms. Oh, and that's a really cold weather mushroom. The enoki grows in December and January around here. Sometimes we'll find them with snow on them. So we call them the winter mushroom or velvet foot or velvet shank because they have like a velvety looking stem. Um, here we have reishi. The wild reishi is exploding in our area because of the woolly adelgid. It's an insect that's destroying our hemlock population. They're killing the trees, but then the reishi starts to grow on the trees in incredible abundance. On the right, we have cultivated reishi that's grown on logs that are completely buried in the soil. So um, the logs are inoculated, uh, trenches are dug, there's sand and rocks at the bottom of the trench for proper drainage. Then you put the logs there and then put the soil back on top. And then if you shade it out, the mushrooms will just grow right through the soil just like that. It's really incredible. Um, we have chanterelles. Chanterelles are super delicious, super beautiful. I love them so much. Um, there's all different types of chanterelles. We have the Cantharellus aplichinensis on the right, which is Appalachian chanterelle. Um, then we have this uh, chanterelle with a somatic mutation where it tries to grow a bunch of caps on top. Um, we have these hedgehogs, which are chanterelle type mushrooms, but they're in a different genus. This is hiddenum, rapandum species. There's a bunch of hiddenum species. Um, there's a lot of different species of these hedgehogs, super delicious. Uh, there's Leo with his, with his abundance of, of hedgehogs. 
Um, here we have craterellus mushrooms. So these are black trumpets. We have two different species of craterellus here, one with more defined fall scales and one with a really, really smooth fall scale. Um, here we have the porcini, um, American porcini. This is a porcini I found in Colorado. Um, this is Boletus ruberceps. This is one of the more delicious American porcinis that I've ever found. Um, uh, one of the, the European names translates to little piggies and I think that they taste like bacon. Um, so they're super delicious. And then we have more chicken in the woods. So you can find chicken in the woods in abundance. There's like 60 pounds of chicken on, on one log there. Um, this is a really funny experience because um, me and my friends saw this off the side of the road. And you can see the road is up there and we're kind of down in a ditch. And one of my friends like accidentally rode off the side of the road and had to get his truck pulled out of the ditch. But the things that we do for mushrooms. Um, this is my shelfie. Um, so you take your little shelfie pictures for Instagram or whatever. Um, here we have honey mushrooms, more honey mushrooms, and this is my take. So around this one tree, there's probably about 10, 15 pounds of my take. There's one right there, one right there, and there's one right there. Um, we pick bunches of them. We take cool pictures, funny pictures. Um, this is about a couple hours in the forest um, during my take season. So you can get hundreds of pounds sustainably. You'll always find more dead mushrooms than living mushrooms. Um, so they're definitely going through the life cycle. And then as you're taking them through the forest, they're going to be dropping their spores around. So you're helping them spread their spores. Um, and you can find loads and loads of my take. Sell this at $15 a pound minimum up to $20 a pound. So when you find a hundred pounds in a day, um, that's really, really good. And you can uh, use these my take to pay your bills in the winter time. If you're in a uh, region where you can find these in abundance. So I typically try and find as much as I can and then like stock up like an animal, eat it or find as much resource as you can and then uh, save your resources to hibernate in the winter time. So, um, William, can I just ask you real quick about rules around harvesting? How much to take, how much to leave? Um, it depends on like the type of thing that you're harvesting. So chaga is definitely like something that can be over harvested because it doesn't grow back that fast. Um, but other mushrooms, I mean like nine times out of 10, you're not able to find as much as there is out there there's always going to be more that are dying than than you can find um so i personally will just take what i need um so if i need to sell 100 pounds i'll take 100 pounds because like there's thousands of pounds out there it's not like i'm putting a dent in what's what's available um, um i i personally just uh take the mushrooms away as well if i even see mushrooms that are dead i'll kick them away because they're dying on top of their fungal body. And if you think like whatever is capable of eating this mushroom, whatever bacteria, whatever fungi are breaking down this mushroom and it's dying on top of its fungal body, that could potentially be uh, detrimental to the fungal body. If I see mushrooms that are like, if you see dead mushrooms on trees, not if, you, if it's still like dead on there, I'll kick it off too, because if you leave it on there, then the mushrooms won't be able to grow from that same spot if there's something that's just dead right there. Um, so that's my take on it. Thank you. Uh, here we have nativized shiitake. So um, shiitake come from Asia and uh, they're non-native to North America, but after cultivating them for 30, 40 years in different areas, um, they finally jumped into the wild and started growing. So this is something that we found in North Carolina. Um, Fairview, North Carolina was one of the first places that had um, uh, native shiitakes growing. And where we usually see them on little logs in cultivation, um, I saw a whole oak tree full of shiitake and this was where I took this picture from. Um, so this was just one of the harvests that me and my friends could take down, but there was definitely way more shiitake up there. Um, here we have the lobster mushroom. This is another parasite that is parasitic on rosula and lactarius mushrooms, um, growing on them and making them taste and smell more like seafood. Um, here we have some truffles. These are European truffles, but a lot of people are having success within the first seven years of planting trees that have been inoculated with truffles, getting truffles to grow on their properties here in the U.S. Um, here we have uh, pecan truffles. Um, and these are like really high value. You can sell truffles from like 200 to $1,000 a pound, depending on the type of truffle. Um, so these are pecan truffles that grow in Georgia and Texas. Super delicious, super fragrant. Again, this is like a flavor enhancer. This is like a seasoning. This is like a really high-end gourmet uh, flavor enhancer for foods. Um, and I actually didn't put it in this presentation, but we went out to uh, Washington last month and we uh, were able to go out truffle hunting with a dog, which was an incredible experience. Where the dog like sniffs out the truffles, digs it up, and then lets you go pick the truffles out of the ground. And then you just give the dog a treat, which is really, really cool. Wow. Um, 
here we have some morels. These are West Coast morels. Um, so in the West Coast, morels will grow in burns, like wherever there's like uh, natural wildfires and things like that. The morels will grow there. Morels really like bacterial rich soils. So once everything's been wiped out and then bacteria is going to become really dominant in the soils and the morels grow, they're actually bacteriophages. They actually eat bacteria. So they like bacterial rich soils, which is pretty interesting. Um, we, can't, we don't really find them in that much abundance on the East Coast. Like I found maybe a fraction of what's in this basket yesterday and I was super happy. Um, here we have the East Coast Porcini. This is Bolita Separans. This is one of the more abundant Porcinis here on the East Coast. Uh, we have candy cat mushrooms, a mushroom that smells like um, maple syrup. Um, and then we have these hawk's wings. And the reason I show this one is because like, there's some people that think cilantro tastes like soap and there's some people that think cilantro is delicious. And this is like similar with this mushroom. This mushroom is bitter to some people and super delicious to other people. It depends on like the person. Um, and then here we have like about a 10 pound lion's mane, 10, 15 pound lion's mane. Um, so the lion's mane can get super huge in the wild. I've never seen a cultivated one get this big, but they can get pretty big in cultivation as well. Um, and this is where I picked this uh, big lion's mane from. So this is two years after, this is two years prior, this is two years after the same tree still producing um, this big old lion's mane. So I think this tree will be producing lion's mane for maybe four or five more years. Um, here we have Horatium Americanum. Oh, and th there's another funny story about this. This one's so high up in the tree that I had to like buy a ladder and then the ladder wasn't big enough and I had to back <laughs> my, my car up to the tree and then like start poking the, mush the mushroom with a big stick. Um, but here we have the Horatium Americanum. Uh, this is another type of lion's mane type mushroom um, that grows on the East Coast and same has those medicinal properties and super delicious. Um, and then here we have bluet mushroom. So the bluet mushroom is a really, really great mushroom for cultivating in compost or cultivating um, in leaf litter. So this one, you can grow in your backyard in leaf litter. If you're raking up the leaves, just leave them in a pile, inoculate them with the bluet mushroom. They'll grow really well through there. Um, so this is some pictures from my festival. Um, I host a mushroom festival the first weekend of August every year. Um, it's called the Mycosymbiotics Mushroom and Arts Festival. We find loads of mushrooms, we put them on a table, we identify them, we put little name tags or put them on plates with identifications on them. Um, well, tell people the location so that if they want to participate, they can know where to find you. Um, the location is in Pennsylvania. So we do this around Harrisburg, Central Pennsylvania every year. And then you can just go on mycofest.net to find more information or get a ticket. Um, so nutraceuticals is a word I've been throwing around a lot through this talk. A nutraceutical is basically a food with medicinal properties. So edible mushrooms, even non-edible mushrooms hold medicinal properties. So like even toxic mushrooms have medicinal properties, but they'll just kill you. So you don't eat those. <laughs> but uh, all, edible mushroom, or all edible mushrooms should be cooked for the highest nutritional uh, benefits, but you don't have to cook them if they're like fresh, if they're not like starting to degrade. You can't eat them raw. Um, and there's some mushrooms that are really good raw, like the uh, Fistulina hepatica or the beefsteak mushroom. Um, and then mushrooms or mycelium grown on edible substrate can also be cooked and eaten. So if you're growing your mushrooms on grains, you can actually eat those grains. If you grow the mushrooms on beans, you can eat the beans. They're like fermented. You can cook with them. They're super delicious. Um, so there's lots of medicinally active compounds like the polysaccharides I talked about, the enzymes and metabolites, the triterpenes. Um, which are like the smelling, uh, the, the things that give the mushrooms their fragrance, the species specific unique compounds, sterols like the ergosterol and lectins. Um, we have nootropic mushrooms like the heresium or the psilocybe, um, which a lot of people, like because the psilocybe are, are illegal at this point in time, not a lot of people um, uh, look to them for medicinal benefits, but now there's research at um, John Hopkins and a couple other universities around the country showing that there are medicinal benefits of these mushrooms, which hopefully will get them reclassified and not in schedule one anymore. Um, schedule one drugs in the US just means that they have no medicinal benefits, but that's crazy because cannabis, as we know, has medicinal benefits is still on schedule one federally and then psilocybin mushrooms, which we now know has medicinal benefits is still schedule one, which is kind of ridiculous. But the psilocybin have been shown to uh, reverse PTSD symptoms and also help people that are coming to like near death or going through cancer experiences and things like that. So super beneficial. So nootropic mushrooms are used to enhance memory and other cognitive functions. So there's another one called Talipocladium ophioglossoides, which is a cordyceps type mushroom that's also beneficial as a nootropic. Um, then we have wildcrafted and cultivated. Basically wildcrafted are going to be higher in uh, vitamin D, sunlight. Mushrooms that are exposed to sunlight have higher vitamin D contents. 
Um, they're adjusted to local microorganisms and contain compounds from the host tree. So like mushrooms that grow on birch trees will have uh, compounds from the tree like xylitol and betulin. Um, and then we have cultivated mushrooms, which are available all year. And you have access to non-local mushrooms, like mushrooms from different countries you can grow here. And we have mycelium versus mushroom extract. So uh, most mycelium, most products on the market, mushroom products, medicinal products are just mycelium, um, which they do. Mycelium does have their benefits, but I'm really a big proponent of mixing mycelium with the mushroom um, together for like, like full spectrum type products. Um, and we have these extracts that are high in polysaccharides, high in tri triterpenes, you can concentrate them and then they allow for utilization of non-edible medicinal mushrooms like hard reishi or chaga. Um, and then there's all sorts of medicinal applications. Um, more people are familiar with like dole extracted tinctures, you can do poultices, um, hot water extracts, which is just tea, you can eat the mushrooms, which are a really great way to get the medicine. Um, smoking them, a lot of friends are starting to smoke lion's mane. Um, I even have some friends that are using reishi, shredded reishi, like a, like a dip. So instead of putting tobacco in their lip, you put mushrooms in there, which can heal the effects of using tobacco in your mouth. Um, and theogenic experiences, mycelium powders, mushroom beer, which is great for people that don't want to take medicine. Um, we have tea baths, so you can brew a big batch of mushroom tea, like reishi or chaga, put it in your bath, and then it'll go through your skin, which is your biggest organ. Uh, food preservation and also like retentional enemas like that's something that's been done in western Siberia with chaga uh, People do retentional enemas. So there's like a lot of people in the health uh, world that are like to do coffee enemas and uh, Haven't really tried chaga which might be even more beneficial. Can you define entheogenic? Uh, entheogenic is just uh, derived from Greek uh, to mean which means to find the god within uh, Which is basically like a psychedelic type experience Okay, great uh, yeah, so cordyceps is the main medicinal mushroom I cultivate. So on the left, we have cordyceps militaris. On the right, we have Tolipocladium ophioglossoides, which is the uh, nootropic type cordyceps that grows on false truffles. Most cordyceps grow on an insect. So we typically find the cordyceps militaris growing on uh, moth pupae or uh, beetle larvae. Um, this is what they look like in cultivation. Um, I've been growing these since 2000, late 2015. Um, this was some of my first setups and then eventually I set up the larger commercial facility in North Carolina um, to grow loads and loads of these cordyceps, which is like the apple of my eye at this point in time. Um, and a lot of my work is like to connect with uh, urban areas and get people that are in urban areas connected with nature. So a lot of the way I dress, the way I talk, the way I present myself on social media is to help connect with those folks because I come from that background. I come from living in the cities where I didn't go camping and hiking and all that kind of stuff when I was young, um, where all this, all this natural, sustainable agriculture, all these kind of things were foreign to me. Um, there were things that I didn't really know anything about or even care about. So I found that um, the way I present myself is very effective for bringing more people from urban areas into this kind of lifestyle. Um, as I do teach in like inner city Baltimore, inner city Atlanta, um, um, New York City and places like that. Um, so yeah, uh, we're reaching the end of the talk here. So I'll just add a little bit more about the festival. Again, it's the first weekend of August. It's, we're on our fifth year. In the past four years, we found three new species of fungi that hadn't been identified by, uh, by science yet. So that's pretty cool. Um, it's getting bigger and bigger every year. So this is from the second year. Last year, there was over 100 people. This year, we expect there to be over 200 people. Um, camping's included in the ticket cost. Food's included in the ticket cost. There's classes all day. There's forays with expert identifiers from around the world or around the country. Um, we eat lots of uh, um, wild mushrooms. We usually find really cool mushrooms like cordyceps. Um, we find lots of edibles like this big old chicken of the woods. This is literally in the first hour of the third annual festival. Um, we found these big old chickens. So, um, and again, we find loads and loads of mushrooms that we all spend time sitting around and identifying, which is a lot of fun. And it's a family friendly event as well. And there's music at nighttime. So, um, I really appreciate you guys having me on for sustainability. Now, um, you can find my, uh, products at mycoshop.net. Um, my website is now mycosymbiotics.net, so I need to change that. But if you do dot blog, I think it still might take you there. Um, my Instagram is mycosymbiote. You can email me at mycosymbiotics at gmail.com. These are the hashtags I use. And then again, if, uh, my YouTube channel is Apex Grower. Um, so yeah, I really appreciate being on here. And I hope you guys got a lot of good information from this presentation. Thank you, William. That was extraordinary. Thank you for joining us. 
keep the momentum going by checking out all the other experts. Every one of them has invaluable information that you can't afford to miss. Buy the Premium Summit Package now. Join the global conversation in our Facebook group and take action in your home, community, or the world at large. Together, we will shape a world that works.